This video is about probabilistic reasoning in robotics. One of the main differences between programming autonomous robots and other types of programming is the menace of uncertainty. So the real world is inherently unpredictable. For example, let's say I want to program a mobile robot to roll out of my office door, navigate the hallways of this building uh, to reach the office of a colleague. So, Assuming I have a really accurate map of the, mil of the building, you might think that I could pre-program a path for my robot that would accomplish that. So drive forward one meter, take it out of my office door, turn 90 degrees to the right, uh, drive forward five meters to get to the end of the hall, turn 90 degrees to the left, and so on. So in practice, that would never work. Even if my map is perfect, and I've planned out the route correctly, and every action is performed exactly as I expect it to by the robot, even just a tiny bit of uncertainty about where the robot actually started would be enough to prevent it from reaching the goal. So even if I'm only off by one degree when I set the robot down to start its path, that little one degree error in the starting orientation would be enough to cause the robot to be off by several feet from where it should be by the time it travels the full distance across the building. So that would definitely be enough to crash into a wall or, hit, or clip a corner on the way. And of course, that little bit of uncertainty about where the robot starts is just one tiny example of all the sources of uncertainty that that robot is going to face as it travels that path. So wheels can slip a little bit. Um, bumps or dirt on the floor might divert the robot from its path. The battery might start to get low so that uh, a command that I thought would move the robot forward a full meter only moves it forward nine-tenths of a meter. Um, and of course, the outside world brings all of its own uh, sources of uncertainty. So somebody could open a door in front of the robot. Uh, there could be a trash can in the hallway blocking its path. A band of hooligans could knock the robot over and spray paint anti-robot propaganda on it. So obviously, the solution is to write our robot control code so that in it incorporates sensor information. We use sensor data to detect uh, unanticipated obstacles, to help keep track of the robot's real position. Unfortunately, sensor data is also inherently noisy, imperfect, and unpredictable. So as an obvious example, if we're trying to use GPS to track the position of the robot, that's really only going to be accurate to within a few meters, probably not enough to, to get it through the hallways, and it might not even work at all indoors. If we're using something like a laser rangefinder, well, we're likely to have missing or incorrect readings in environments with reflective surfaces, because those lasers are going to, to bounce off those surfaces. And that's the problem we find ourselves in. We want to write code that allows our robots to reliably accomplish their goals, uh, but the world is inherently unpredictable, and our sensors are always going to be imperfect. These are problems that aren't going to go away. We can, we can build a better sensor, uh, we can try to engineer our robot so that its actions are accomplished more reliably, but we'll never completely eliminate all of those sources of uncertainty. We're always going to have to take them seriously. So what's the solution? A big part of the solution is probability theory. Probability provides a very well-developed mathematical framework for reasoning about uncertainty. Um, in, in large part, the successes we've seen in autonomous, autonomous robotics over the last decade or so have been built on these probabilistic algorithms, probabilistic approaches to sensing and control. So concretely, what is probability going to do for us? Um, we'll be able to use the tools of probability to update our existing beliefs on the basis of new sensor data. Uh, we will be able to use the tools of probability theory to combine multiple conflicting sources of information. So example, if we have two sensors uh, that are both supposed to be giving us information about the location of the robot, maybe a GPS sensor and some sort of laser rangefinder, um, what do we do when those are telling us uh, or, we're, or the information that we're getting from those sensors is giving us two different estimates of where we think the robot actually is? Um, and ideally, we want to come up with a, a final estimate that's more accurate than either of those sources of information could give us alone, independently, and we'll be able to do that. Related to that, we're going to want to be able to combine uncertain predictive models, so we have some belief about how our robot moves, the effects of its actions, but those are going to be uh, uncertain. We're never going to be perfectly confident about what's going to happen when we tell the robot to do something. 
uh, but we can come up with, with probabilistic models to describe what we expect to happen. And we want to be able to combine what the model predicts with what the sensor data tells us. So that's another sort of example of this problem of combining information from multiple imperfect sources. Um, so that's kind of the agenda. That's where we're going. Today we're going to focus on one. If we have some existing belief about the state of the world or the position of the robot or anything, and we get some new evidence from a sensor or from some other source, how do we update that existing belief, belief on the basis of that new information? Let's get started by doing a quick review of some probability notation and some probability basics. Uh, this is just going to be a couple of minutes long, so if you haven't taken a course where you studied some probability, this won't be adequate. You're going to have a little bit of extra work to do. Uh, so I'm assuming that everybody taking, who's taking this course has taken a discrete math course and you've seen this content before, so this is just a refresher. And today we're mostly going to be dealing with, or we'll only be dealing with, uh, discrete probability distributions. Uh, as we move forward in the class, we'll think more about continuous probability distributions, and most of the math is going to carry over without too much difficulty. But today we'll just think about discrete distributions. So what's the notation here? Um, we'll often see something like P of A. Uh, this could be read as the prior probability of A. Um, this is a function that maps from all possible values of the variable A to the probability of that corresponding event. So A could be a Boolean variable, so maybe A represents whether I uh, am able to find my keys tomorrow morning. So A equals true means that I do find my keys, A equals false means that I don't, and maybe there's a 90% chance that I will and a 10% chance that I won't. So these have to add up to one because these are mutually exclusive. I either will find my keys or I won't. We may also have a, a random variable that can take on more than two values, so maybe I'm interested in the probability um, uh, distribution over the color of shirt that I'm going to pick tomorrow if I just reach in and pull out a shirt at random. So uh, that would be B, and this would represent the probability that I'll randomly select a red shirt, and since 80% of my shirts are red, that's 80% likely to be the case, and 10% for blue and 10% for green. And again, no matter how many possible outcomes we have here, uh, those have to sum to 1. So typically we're going to be interested in situations where we actually have multiple uh, random variables that we're considering and we're interested in how they interact with each other. So the sample space refers to the set of all possible outcomes for all of our possible variables. And we can express everything that there is to know about the sample space as the, point, as the full joint probability distribution. So that's a function uh, that maps every possible assignment to the variables to the probability of that set of assignments. And here's the full uh, joint probability distribution for a scenario involving being squished and ending up under a piano. So S refers to uh, ending up squished on a particular day. U uh, refers to ending up underneath a falling piano on a particular day. And this table shows the probability of every possible pair of those outcomes. So the sort of most probable outcome would be that neither of those things happen. I don't end up squished, and I don't end up under a piano, and that's most of the probability mass here. Um, and you can see we've expressed some, uh, some probabilities for the other possible outcomes. And again, exactly one of these rows in this table has to be the case on any particular day. So these things always need to sum to 1 in this table. Sometimes uh, it can be instructive or help us get a better feel for things if we express these uh, sample spaces as a Venn diagram, um, where different areas of the Venn diagram represent possible outcomes. So in this case, I might want the area of the different parts of the diagram to be somewhat proportional to the probability, so most of this area would be uh, devoted to the case where I am neither squished or end up under a piano. Um, and then there's some probability that I end up squished, and some probability that I end up under a piano and some probability that both of those things happen, representing by that represented by that overlap. Uh, 
Um, great. This isn't really to scale, right, uh, because the probabilities involved are too small to make that possible. So we, particularly when we're going to start dealing with um, sensor data, we are often interested in conditional probability distributions. So that's expressed this way, and we would read this as P of the probability of A given B. So conditional probabilities allow me to talk about, well, what's the probability that A is true given that I know B to be true? It's not the same as and. I'm not saying A and B are true. Um, maybe there's a very small chance that they're both true, but A is very likely to be true if I know B is true. Uh, so for, an ex for example, I can talk about the prior probability. So prior probability as opposed to a conditional probability. This is what I believe about the probability that I'll be squished given that I don't know anything else, right? I don't know whether I ended up under a piano on a particular day or not. So um, that's a 1% chance. But the probability that I'll end up squished, if you tell me, if I know that I ended up under a piano, is much higher. That's almost 90%. And these values follow from that joint probability distribution, distribution that I saw I showed you before. Um, and here's the definition of conditional probability. Here's how I can calculate conditional probability. Uh, the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B, those things are both true, over the, the prior probability of B. And that, I think, makes some sense if you look back at our Venn diagram. So the prior probability of getting squished is just, we can think of that as the area of this little circle here. It's quite small. Uh, there's a small probability, if I don't know anything else, uh, that I've been squished. The probability that I've been squished, given that I know that I ended up under a piano, now I'm restricting myself to just thinking about this little part of the world. I know that I was under a piano, so I know that I'm in here somewhere. Well, what's the probability that I got squished? Well, that's the area of this piece over the area of this piece. And that's much higher, right? So if you tell me that I ended up under a piano, well, actually, there's a pretty large chance that I ended up squished. And right, we could determine that value just by plugging in entries from our, from our table. So the probability that I was uh, squished and ended up under a piano, that top there, that's 0 0.008, 0 0.008. Um, mm, how would I figure out the probability, the prior probability of um, ending up under a piano? This part here. Well, I'd have to find all of the rows in the table where I ended up under a piano, this one and this one, add them up, and that's the total probability that I would end up under, under a piano. The probability that I am under a piano, given that I was squished and given that I wasn't squished. So I won't go through that math, but I'll let you do it if you find it entertaining and edifying. So that leads us to Bayes' rule. And uh, Bayes' rule is probably the most useful identity in robotics, or maybe in all of artificial intelligence. Um, and it can be derived from our definition of conditional probability. Uh, so let's just take a look at what it means. And I probably should have chosen some different, different variable names here to make it clear why this is so useful. So let's call instead of H, let's make that H. Or instead of A, let's make it H. Instead of B, let's make that E. And we'll think of this as what's the probability of some hypothesis given some evidence. So what's the probability that I think something is true that I'm interested in, given some piece of information that I've been provided with? Uh, and that's a very general way of describing what inference is, right? So I want to be able to update what I think based on the information that I've been given. And Bayes' rule gives us a general piece of machinery for solving that problem. So what do I need to know to apply Bayes' rule? Well, I need to know what's the probability I would have given, given, gotten that piece of information, gotten that evidence, given that that, was the, that the hypothesis was true. I also need to know, well, what's the prior probability of that hypothesis? And when people talk about Bayesian inference, this is really what they're talking about. They're talking about the fact 
that when we're performing Bayesian inference, that when we're using Bayes' rule, we're incorporating our prior belief about something. So we're generally not going into a situation blind where we have no uh, prior information about the system. We believe that we have some prior knowledge, some prior distribution, and we're updating that distribution based on new information. And that's, that's Bayesian reasoning or Bayesian inference. And all of that is over the probability of seeing that piece of evidence, or probability of seeing that evidence. So that's Bayes' rule. And what I want to do in the rest of this video is just work through an example of using Bayes' rule to solve a really simple problem in robotics. And here's the scenario we're going to be interested in. Um, let's, let's assume that we have a little tiny four-room maze and there's a robot in that maze, and its mission in life is to try to figure out which room it's in. Is it in room A, B, C, or D? Or to update its belief about which room it's in. And before that robot gets any additional outside information, it's been told, uh, robot, we think you're probably in room A or B, you're probably not in room C or D. So we'll encode that as there's a 40% chance he's in A, a 40% chance he's in B, 10% in C and D. So that's our prior. That's what we believe about the world before we get any evidence. Uh, and I'm using X to denote the true state of the world, and that's going to be pretty standard in robotics when you read probabilistic robotics algorithms. Uh, generally, X will be used to denote the actual underlying state of the world, and Z will be used to denote uh, data coming from a sensor. So we can rewrite Bayes' rule in terms of X and Z, uh, and this is saying that, well, what I want to know is what the actual state of the robot is given the fact that I received this sensor reading. And what I'm going to need to do that is going to be my prior distribution, my prior belief about this, where I was in the state of the world. In this case, that's my 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And this, an understanding of if I'm in a particular state of the world, what's the probability that I'll see a particular sensor reading? And this is generally referred to as a sensor model. This is a model of how my sensor works. What will my sensor do? Or what's the distribution over what the things that my sensor might do, given uh, a particular way that the world actually is? So here's our prior belief. Um, here's what we'll take to be our sensor model in this situation. So this robot has a sensor that attempts to tell him what room he is in. So he runs the sensor, he clicks the button, and it says, beep, you are in room A, or you are in room B. It gives him some information about what room he's in. So of course, life would be easy if that sensor were perfectly accurate, if it always said the correct room, but we're going to assume that it's not. And here's, here's, what, here's how we can describe this sensor model. So it's 80% likely to report he's in the correct room. So this expresses the possible outcomes if the robot is actually in room A. If he's actually in room A, there's an 80% chance the sensor will say A. There's a 10% chance it'll say he's in room B. There's a 10% chance he'll say he's in room D. But there's 0% chance he'll say he's in room, the robot is in room C, right? The, the sensor is never that wrong. Um, so this table is expressing the, the, the probabilities of different sensor readings given that he's in room A. Um, these are those same probabilities written in a different way. So our goal then is to update our belief about where the robot is given the fact that we've run the sensor and received a particular uh, output. So in this case, for the, the example that we're going to work through, we're going to assume that we clicked the button, we ran the sensor, and it said, B. So our goal is to figure out how does that change our belief about where the robot might be. Um, and it's going to be a pretty straightforward process. Mostly I'm just going to plug what I know into Bayes' rule, turn the crank, and get the, the answer that I want out. So notice here, I'm using Bayes' rule to try to figure out, well, what's the probability I end up in room A, given that that's the sensor reading I saw? And to update my full uh, distribution over x, to completely update my belief about, about x, I'm going to have to do this four times, right? I'm going to have to execute Bayes' rule to update my belief about a, and then about b, and then about c, and then about d. 
Um, so first, let's just think about how how the sensor reading saying B changes my belief that I'm in room A, or what it how how I can figure out the probability of being room A, in room A. Well, here's Bayes' rule. Um, I need to plug in my sensor model for this situation. So here, well, if I was in room A, what would the probability of of receiving B be from the sensor? Well, that's going to be 0.1, right? That's the probability that the sensor is off by one. What was my prior belief that I was in room A? It was 0.4, if you remember from our original priors. So this is going to be the tricky part. What was my prior belief that the sensor would say B based on what I know about my sensor model and based on my prior belief about where the robot actually was? Uh, this requires some additional calculation to figure that out. And how can we do that? Well, there are a couple of ways we can think about it. One is we can use an identity called the total probability theorem. In this, uh, informally, right, we're going to take advantage of the idea that we know the robot actually was, or actually is, in one of those rooms. There are four possible rooms. So if the robot was in room A, for example, we have some probability of that there's some probability that we would have seen um, that sensor reading B. So this term, probability of being in room A times the probability of seeing uh, that sensor reading B in room A, that's the probability of, of that outcome, right? The probability of being in room A and seeing sensor reading B. And there are only four rooms I could be in, right? I could be in room A and have seen sensor reading B. I could be in room B and see sensor reading B. I could be in room C and see sensor reading B. So if I add up across all of those possibilities, that gives me the total probability that I could see that, that I would see that sensor reading B. So I can do that, and that can allow me to uh, infer this probability of seeing B. The other thing that I can do is just recognize the fact that um, while I'm interested in the outcome for four possible rooms, Across all of those rooms, the sensor reading was the same, right? It was, it was B in every case. So this number, we can treat for the moment as just some constant. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's the same number for every room. We really did see this sensor reading B. That's, that's not in question. Um, so we'll just treat the probability of seeing that, that as a constant, and it's common to maybe express that as eta. So here, what we're really doing is we're, we're rewriting 1 over probability of z as eta, and that's giving us this slightly different looking version of Bayes' rule. And then what I can do is, once I've calculated the probability of the, the updated probability of x um, in terms of eta, I can go back and figure out what eta must have been by taking advantage of the fact that I know that I ended up in one of those rooms, so all of those probabilities are going to have to add up to one. So we'll, that's the approach we'll take, and we'll see how that works out. So I probably should have not written this this way, but written this with my eta here. Uh, so now I can plug in the terms to, to run Bayes' rule. Remember, this was uh, 0.1, this was 0.4. That's eta. So my now my updated belief about my about the probability that it ended up in A, given that that was the sensor reading I saw, is this 0.04 times eta. And then I can do the same thing for all the other rooms. I want a, a full distribution, right? So I want to know the probability that is in every possible room. So for room B, well, the sensor reading there would say 0.8. Uh, that's what my sensor model would say. That's the probability that I got it right. This represents the case where the sensor was correct. And my prior belief about being in room B was 0.4, so that gives me 0.32. Again, I still don't know eta, so I'll just leave that as eta. And then I can do the same thing for rooms C and D. And notice D will end up, uh, the probability that I'm in D, given I got sensor reading B, is going to be 0, because the sensor model tells me that the sensor is never that wrong. Right? There's a 0 probability that the sensor would say um, B if I was actually in room D. So this uh, represents my, my probability distribution after I've performed Bayes' rule. It's in terms of this eta, which I don't actually know the value of that eta yet, but I do know that the robot ended up in one of these rooms. He had to end up somewhere, so these all have to add up to one, so then I can just do a little bit of algebra to figure out what eta must have been 
uh, that's happening here. So eta was 2.70. Uh, and then I can multiply that out, and this gives me my my posterior distribution over a, my distribution over a, or over x, my distribution after I take into account that sensor reading, right? The sensor said b, and I think these results make intuitive sense, right? Remember my original probability distribution before I received that sensor reading was this. Then the sensor said I was here, b, so it makes sense certainly that this would be the highest probability after that after I've taken that information into account right if the sensor said B and the sensor is somewhat reliable that's going to increase my belief that I'm here um, the sensor doesn't really provide any way right it could equally likely have been here or here just based on the sensor reading but my prior belief that I was here was higher so it makes sense that after I incorporate that sensor data I'm still think it's more likely that I was there than I'm here and this is now impossible right this is dropped to zero and that makes sense because given that the sensor reading said B, uh, that could not have been the case if I had actually been in state D. So this is what the math gave us, and I think it, it makes sense, uh, it makes intuitive sense that that would be the result. Now at this point you might have the thought, well, uh, if I'm that robot, I'm still not totally sure where I am, so can I just run my sensor again to get additional information, incorporate that, uh, to get a better estimate of my true position. And you can certainly do that. Um, and assuming that those errors are independent from one time step to the next, that will allow you to improve your estimate of where you are by repeatedly executing the sensor, treating this now as your new prior, and going through the whole process again with a new sensor estimate. And we're going to be continually, so we're going to start thinking in that direction a little bit more uh, as we move forward, but the point today is just to to handle that one problem. If I have a prior belief distribution, I gain some some data from a sensor. How can I update that belief distribution?